Welcome to a very unique Gary Has Issues. It turns out my partner, Ken Seisler, has some very interesting friends. And one of them is television and film producer Mark Gordon. Mark happens to be one of the most successful and prolific producers in the industry. Among his many movie credits are Speed, little thing called Saving Private Ryan, uh, The Day After Tomorrow, Molly's Game, Murder on the Orient Express, and his television credits are just as impressive. Uh, cultural milestones, in fact, like Grey's Anatomy, uh, Criminal Minds, Ray Donovan. Well, the other day, Mark joined me and Ken to talk about his films and TV and the state of the industry in general. It was absolutely fascinating. In fact, we talked for several hours. It was so much that we couldn't just edit all this great stuff down into one 30-minute, 40-minute show. So we decided to make it a few shows. So we now present our conversation with Mark Gordon, part one. I brought him up to my wife, no idea who he was. To my son, who's an aspiring actor, no idea who he was. Went over to the neighbor, said, I'm having so-and-so on the show. No idea who he was. This is a great introduction, Gary. Yeah, I was just going to say. <laughs> but but then I brought up, shut here. up, both of you. I brought up what he's done, what he's produced, what he has brought into American culture. Oh, a little film called Speed, for example, with Keanu Reeves. The Patriot with that crazy guy. A film called Saving Private Ryan. And that's just some of his film work. Um, how about... In television, Grey's Anatomy, my wife started getting very excited, asking him about Patrick Dempsey, blah, blah, blah. Criminal Minds, Ray Donovan, obviously some very seminal work. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mark Gordon. That was very kind. So I want to go back to the fact that not many people know Mark Gordon, even though he's produced these iconic um, films and uh, culture-changing TV shows. Seminal? Seminal, seminal films and seminal. television shows that yeah. you they may recognize for bad reasons harvey weinstein but they'll know jerry brockheimer they'll know scott rudin they'll know brian Graydon. they'll know a lot of those people's names and so the fact is you have your movies and your tv shows are incredibly high profile but you're not right right so that's the answer to that question. Thank you, Mark. Well, that's fine. You know, first of all, let me just say this. Some people go for the publicity. I'm interested in the cash. <laughs> so that's really how it, how it breaks down. Actually, that's not true, but it sounded like it might be humorous. So right. I said it anyway. I'm going to not take this call. Okay. Um, look, here, here's the thing. I believe that... The work needs to speak for itself. It's not about me. Um, and the fact is that very few producers are, are well known. There are some of the ones that, that you've talked about uh, that have, have been very successful um, and have an enormous amount of publicity attached to them. Um, that's not of, of interest to me. What's interesting to me is the work. So you're rarely going to see me at a premiere. You're rarely going to see me at a party. You're rarely going to see me with my arm around a, sub, a, 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 a celebrity. Um, it's just not. It's just not the part of the business that interests me. Um, I'm not a particularly controversial guy. Uh, some of the people that you mentioned, uh, their celebrity is based on on their controversy, and some of them, by the way, are because though I have been quite successful. Some of the other people that you mentioned are wildly successful. Jerry Bruckheimer is, is rich and famous because, probably because of all the CSIs that we've seen on the air. And you keep seeing his name. You know, I had Criminal Minds. That was one show. I think there were three or four CSIs. And also Jerry Bruckheimer has made a slew of hugely high profile movies. Um, and the kind of films that he makes, they, they are Jerry Bruckheimer movies more than they are anything else. My movies, I, I, don't, I don't really think that there's an identification where there's a Mark Gordon movie. And that's because of the kind of movies that I choose to make, which are very eclectic. So there might be a small movie like Molly's Game, and then there might be a little movie that we made for $6 million called The Messenger, 
that only uh, cost six million dollars. And then there's Day After Tomorrow, and and those are Roland Emmerich movies. And then there's uh, you know Saving Private Ryan, and that's a Steven Spielberg movie. So so interestingly enough, and and certainly they made different kinds of movies. But if you think of a of a great producer like David O. Selznick, most people won't be able to tell you who the director of Gone with the Wind was, mm. but they'll be able to tell you who the producer was. He was that kind of producer. And oddly, Jerry Bruckheimer is in many ways David O. Selznick in that those are, are producerial movies. I just pick interesting material and, and there's a broad range now I'm repeating myself, but I think you understand. Yeah, um, right. And also, I don't ask, I'm not interested in, 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 in getting my name in the paper other than to advance my business opportunities. And I'm not saying that these people are, but it's, you know, we have different kinds of careers. Does, that, you, does yeah, that answer the question? Yeah, absolutely. I want to talk about the fact that you, because uh, I want to define what a producer is for people out there. And especially well, because you were the president of the Producers Guild in, of America. Right. And as president of the Producers Guild in, in America, you made substantial changes in defining what the role of the producer is. And that little PGA seal of approval, right? That's, That's you. Mark. That's Mark. That, that is something that, that my, my co-president, fellow president, Hawk Koch and I spent years while we were presidents of the guild of uh, pushing forward. Um, you know, the interesting thing about a producer is that it, it, it there are so many different kinds of producers. Um, you know, there uh, producers uh, do different things in television than they do in movies. There are line producers who are basically responsible for the physical production, which means the day to day managing of the financial and production aspects of the movie. Um, there are producers who are really great packagers and put things together um, and are not good with the physical production or maybe even the creative part of, of uh, developing and producing movies. Um, I, I, I think that... Well, that what do you answer to the question when people, you know, people... People probably say, oh, what do you do for a living? And you say, I'm a producer. I'm and producer. how often do they go, what, and what, what does a producer do? What I, the answer that I give is that I am responsible from the beginning to the end, generally, for everything that you see on the screen from the beginning of the uh, process. The producer is usually the first one in and the last one out the door. The producer uh, will create or work with a writer to create. Uh, but this uh, is specifically movies. Story. Well, movies and television, both. It depends. Oh, yeah, okay. I mean, it depends, but if you want to get a single answer, it's who is it that's responsible for creative, financial, marketing of a movie and or television show from the beginning to end? Now, there are, in television, there are executive producers who are creators, they're showrunners, they're writers. Um, it's very complicated in television because what is normally seen as a producerial responsibility in television, you've got writers taking producer credits. And the reason the writers take producer credits is because television is even more so than movies, a collaborative process. So one producer may be spending time in the editing room. Another producer may be standing on the set. The writer of that episode may be the producer of that episode. They may be running the room. They may be doing all, all different kinds of things. And if you ask on a television show, the showrunner will say, we are a team of producers. But the fact of the matter is, is that a lot of writers, not to be controversial, they will get a producer credit so they don't have to get, uh, they don't have to pay them more money. And you, you automatically go up the chain of, you know, story editor to consulting producer, to co-producer, to co-executive producer, to producer, to executive producer. And usually those are basically how long have you been in the game and how long have you been doing it as opposed to whether you're really hands-on producing the movie. In, in, in television, it's more of psychic reward, right? It makes people feel better to get a producer. 
Yeah, and so in films, people, right? Which was true in films. Uh, well, what's, which is what's, why you came up with the PGA designation. Which is yes, but in film it's a little easier because in film it doesn't take. It certainly didn't used to take an army of people to make movies. When when independent films started coming into vogue and and people were getting their movies financed outside the studio system, which is a fairly black and white process, you you had financiers who were coming in. They wanted to produce by credit. You had managers of actors. They wanted to produce by credit. You had a lot of people who wanted to take a produced by credit. Why? Because it's the better credit and because the Academy Awards only give the award to the producer, meaning produced by, as opposed to executive producer. Um, and so the fact of the matter is, is that the producer in, in film, they have to be the person that actually produced the movie. And if you didn't produce the movie, take an executive producer credit. And that's what we tried in the, in the, in the uh, Producers Guild to, to, make people understand and it took years to get the studio to recognize the fact that you don't give a you don't you don't have multiple people who helped the dp take the dp credit you don't have a gaffer who lit the film and who supervised the lighting they're best boys and there's a best boy he's the number two and then there are electricians and then there are grips the guy who's the prop master has an assistant prop master but not everybody takes the prop master credit. So it's a legitimate credit. I will say that many people don't know how to produce a movie who get a producer credit. If you've got 50 bucks and you option a script, you can be a producer. Any schmuck can call himself a producer, and that's why it's such a great... And if any schmuck would know that, you would be the one. <laughs> Mark. I'm the schmuck who knows <laughs> no, it. no, I just, okay. just want to uh, ask something, because I think the PGA designation is the good housekeeping seal of approval for the audience as well, so that when people watch a movie and they see the little PGA, they know that that person actually was that, yeah, did, did, those work. Work, did those work. Yeah, yeah. But my question is, can somebody take a producer credit yeah. And oh, they still can, and not get the PGA designation, or the only so that yeah, you can literally you have somebody on screen you that what, you'll have two producers, and one producer will get the PGA, and the other producer will not. Yes, recently I finished a a, a big budget studio picture. Um, it was a sequel to a movie that I made. The first the first film I took a producer credit because I found the material, found the writer, sold it to the studio, found the director, hired the actors. I really did supervise and do my job. On the second picture, I had very little to do with it. It was the same director. Um, he had a producing partner. She was producing the movie day to day. And I really wasn't involved. And I went to the other producers of the movie, um, a few of whom were doing as little or less work than I was. And I said, hey, take an executive producer credit with me. We didn't produce the movie. And even if you try, you're not gonna get the PGA mark because you, you, didn't, you don't qualify. You didn't produce the movie. One of the producing partners of mine agreed to take an executive producer credit with me. And two of them chose to take the producer credit without getting the PGA mark. And I argued that why don't you take, a, take an executive producer credit and set a good example because it's the truth. Don't take credit when you don't deserve it. So some people have a, an ethical, moral approach to these kinds of things. And some people just want the produced by credit because it's the, the higher level credit, even if they don't get the PGA mark. But if you get an Oscar, can you receive the Oscar with the producer credit, but not with the PGA designation? No. no. So you have, to have, you have to have the PGA in order to get up on stage and take the award. Almost always. Now, the, the, the Producers Guild vets the credits, and that information goes over to the Motion Picture Academy, when it's time to consider people for Academy Awards. There have been, in rare circumstances, times when the Motion Picture Academy has reversed the decision of the Producers Guild. It's happened maybe twice in the last 10 years, um, and, and 
so rarely if ever happens but the fact is that though the produced uh, the motion picture academy relies on the producers guild to do that vetting because it's it's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of movies every year it, when when it comes down to academy awards it's not a pure rubber stamp they have the right to to change it if they so desire but for the most part that's correct mark let me ask you a question so how do you attach yourself how do you find a project like speed does a script come across your desk and you say okay it's a story of a bus that can't go over 55 miles an hour how do you say this is what i'm going to get behind and develop how does how does this start how do you find a project you know it's it's always different in the case of speed um it was a, a script that went out uh, it was a spec script so the writer wrote it on his own without being paid to write it and and owned it um, it went out to n a number of different producers, uh, myself included. I read the script and I thought it was really interesting. Um, and I said, we, we would like to be a part of this. Uh, I was given the script for Paramount. So it, it's, it still works this way where, where occasionally a spec script will come out. And if you have a relationship at Paramount, you might get it for Paramount. This guy might get it for Warner Brothers because the conventional wisdom is that if you have a deal at that studio, Warner Brothers, Paramount, no longer, there's no longer a Fox, but Disney, MGM, Sony, uh, whatever, um, you have a better chance of convincing that studio to buy the script because you have a special relationship with them. I had a deal at Paramount. Did I have a deal at Paramount at the time? No, I don't I think it was that deal at Paramount where they were trying to get you out of your office. I remember that deal. We're, we're going we're gonna to circle back to that story. Because that story changed my life. I've been thrown out of a better place than Paramount. <laughs> we're going back. We're going but, back. But in that case, I read the script. I really liked it. I gave it to Paramount. Just so happened that nobody else was interested in it. Paramount bought it. Um, it took forever to get the deal done. Don't ask me why. Like nine months. We developed the script at Paramount. They ultimately decided not to make it. They gave it back to me. I took it to, to 20th Century Fox, and they decided they wanted to make the movie. But every film is different. Saving Private Ryan uh, was an original idea of Bob Rodatz, and he brought me a true story, and we adapted it into... Well, before you go into all of this stuff, because yeah. this is what I, I think, because you have so much, so many credits and so many movies to talk about. Yeah. I thought I would do, I'm going to call it a, a Rorschach test. <laughs> you want me to just like whatever comes into my mind? Oh, I am going to say the name of the movie. Like, you know, uh, like you could say something and I could go asshole. Or yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Exactly. All right, let's start. We're going to do it a, by year. We're going to do it by year. Yeah, okay. The first mo your first feature, and correct me if I'm wrong, Opportunity Knocks. Yes, sir. Uh, a good, good, uh, I'm not, I, I clearly have not had a lot of success in comedy. So maybe I should just leave it at that. I thought I was funny and maybe <laughs> some of the, some of the people listening to this will think so, but, but I haven't been able to translate to that screen. I, uh, to the screen, I think I'm stuck on Preston Sturgis and Howard Hawks and I'm not like a current comedy guy. But so, Opportunity Knocks was an opportunity knocking for you. That was Dana Carvey. Really did. That, yes, it was Dana Carvey. Yeah. That yeah. was the, that yeah. movie. That made you a film first, producer. My first studio picture, yes. And so that got you. So the reaction to that was, okay, he can make a movie. We, we trust him to make a movie, even if it's a flop. At least he knows Speaking that. of flops, yeah. yes. Swing Kids. Well, Swing Kids, you know, was heartbreaking, actually. Um, I loved that project. I loved what it was about. Did you know what it was about, Gary? Have you heard of that movie, Swing Kids? I, I, probably. I don't the remember it. Nazis. I could have said that Christian Bale was in it. I he remember that. It, yes. Kenneth uh, Branagh. Ken Branagh yes. was in yes. uh, Barbara Hershey. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, it was a wonderful cast. Um, but but the, the movie... Tell the premise, for those who don't know. The, the uh, in, true, true story, true events in, in Hamburg, Germany and throughout Germany, but primarily in Hamburg, there were a group of kids who were fanatical 
uh, uh, jazz uh, aficionados. Benny Goodman, Big Spiderbeck, Louis Armstrong, yeah. Big Band, Swing. And, um, and they had long hair and they wore these kind of funny British clothes. And you, they were almost like, you know, the hippies of days gone by and in terms of the way they dressed. Um, and, and this was right around the time that, that Hitler was coming to power and there was the Hitler Youth. And there was a, a real antagonist. And you said you didn't do comedy. Exactly. Right, right, yeah. It was, it, trust me, the reviews were the same as, as, as where you're heading. Um, but they were... But your cast was amazing. Great yeah. cast. And I thought it was a fairly good movie. I didn't love it. Uh, but I thought it, was, I thought it was good and I thought it was worthy. Um, you but know, off of Swing Kids, off of that, which was a flop. Thank you. Speed was your next movie after that. This is like, this is your life, Mark Gordon. Yeah. yeah. Mark, if you, I have behind you. And, yeah. and, and Keanu, and I, we're, we're going off the game here, but, but Keanu Reeves, I mean, I, he was great, but I never would have connected if I saw that script. Oh, Keanu Reeves is the right action star for this. Well, we didn't either. Um, you know, it's interesting. You, Keanu was, you know, you, 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 he wasn't a movie star. He was a celebrity. He had been in a couple of uh, films. He was in, in Bill and Ted's, right. which was obviously a very different tone. <laughs> um, and, and he was also in Point Break, which was a little more the tone of, of speed. But he wasn't a big star. And of course, what happens in a movie uh, is that most of the time, and this was a fairly inexpensive film, I think the movie cost about $26 million at the time. Um, but that wasn't cheap. It wasn't like a six million dollar, eight million dollar. You know, I think opportunity oh. knocks the budget was ten. Could you um, imagine what speed would cost today? Well, yeah, it would cost a lot. But it, but but if it had been the same director and 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 me, it would have cost less than it would have cost if a bigger director had right, done right, even that. Right. But the point is, we went out to a few movie star types: Bruce Willis, <laughs> oddly enough, at the time, Billy Baldwin, who was sure. a much no, bigger star. Um, and they, they turned us down and, and I was able to get the studio to bring their expectation down about who would be right for it. And the interesting thing about, about the character was that he was, a, a, he was not a verbose, uh, it, it wasn't about the dialogue, it was about the presence of this character um and keanu had the presence and we didn't know did you screen test him no we didn't test him he was he was too big for a test but not big enough to go slam dunk movie star what about sandra bullock sandy bullock we tested a number of times because we couldn't get our first choice halle berry oh my goodness well, it would have been a good choice but boy was sandra bullock knocked no. out of the park sandy was just so funny and charming, but she had done virtually nothing. The only real credit that she had was in a Joel Silver picture called um, Demolition, was it Demolition Man? Demolition Man. Yep, and she had a, she was kind of funny and charming in that movie. Um, but you know, we are, she just came in and auditioned. It wasn't even like, oh, let's offer it to Sandy and test her. She came in with, like a lot of other women did to test for the part and she was just so great. And, and so we had Keanu, who was a celebrity, not a giant star. We had, um, we had Sandy. And then we had, literally, we had already started shooting when Dennis Hopper's name came up. And we had gone through 40 names of people that we either offered it to and said no, or that the studio, on the one hand, couldn't agree with, uh, with me and Jan de Bont, the director. And so we were like, you know, oh, we don't like that guy. Oh, you don't like this guy. Oh, we don't like this guy. You don't like that guy. We, we're shooting in three days. It's like, well, we gotta fucking get somebody here. And so that was Dennis. And I was worried that, you know, is Dennis too big? Is Dennis too broad? Is, is he kind of oh, a little wow. cartoony? He was because so Dennis focused. at that time, he was sober. But he was still, Dennis Hopper was kind of a cartoon character at that point. And I must tell you that even after seeing the first cut of the movie, Dennis was so big and so broad. And I said, is this going to work? Is this, 
I mean, I, I thought it was fun, but I was worried that he was, is he in a different movie? Is this thing, is he too over the top? And the answer was, yes, he was, but the audience loved it. Yeah. And so you just never know. I mean, I you never know because you, it's a, you look at that movie and you go, how could it be anybody else but those right. people? Of course. Of it, course. But like, I'll tell you, I will tell you that if people are honest, mostly it's happenstance. I, I cannot tell you that any of the success of that movie was by design. The same with the director. Nobody would touch the damn movie with a 10 foot pole. And Jan de Bond, who had never directed a movie before, but who was this brilliant cameraman, I took him into the studio and, and the first meeting that, that he had with them, he blew it. He, he was nervous, he couldn't, he, English was not his first language. He was kind of stuttering all over the place. And I got a call after the first meeting from the studio saying, well, that guy's not directing the movie. I said, no, 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 no. we're not hiring an actor. We're hiring a director. Don't, don't, he didn't have a good meeting, but that doesn't mean he's not the right guy. So I literally brought him in and said, Jan, we're going to do like a role playing here. I'm going to be the studio executive and you're going to be you. And we got to prepare for this because you, you sucked in that meeting and it matters. <laughs> you got to be, you got to be something. So we did it. We, I, I, I basically trained him to, to, to be good in a room because so, he wasn't used to that. It's not when you're in, that's what a producer does. Well, that's right. When your instincts feel that he's the right director, it's the right, right. script. It's the right actor. You really go to bat for them. You really must have a vision. You, you you have to do that. And sometimes, as I have been in the past, you can be terribly wrong. And you can take a great piece of material and destroy it by hiring the wrong director. And I've done that multiple times, I will tell perhaps, you. Perhaps it'll be on my list. Well, I'm not going to talk, talk no, about it. No, I know. It. By the way, you can... No, listen, listen, Dennis is dead. I can say whatever the fuck I want to about him. <laughs> I love him. And he was great in the movie. Right, right. right. See, but, no, I just want you to know that as I go down the list, if the, you can just say pass. I, I sure. will. Because okay. we, you know, but Kenny, if you go down this whole list, we'll be here till tomorrow morning. Well, I, 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 the title of this show and is Gary has issues and Kenny has too much free Kenny time. Kenny has nothing but time. So but I'm already fine. Mark's phone is ringing. But let me get to this: a I pyromania, will, I, a pyromania's love story. Yes. <laughs> and I know why, but okay. that's a different story. Don't say anything. The hoax. Richard Gere. I love that movie. Great Russell movie. Um, very proud of that film. Do you know what um, that was about, Gary? I, I, I'm sorry, I don't. It's That's right. okay. That's all right. That's you all right. and nobody else. You, I, what did not open at a theater near me? No, it did. It was a great movie, and somehow it just got lost. It, it was. I remember it came out 2005, it's 2006. Eric, it's a very hard movie to sell. It was the true story of how Clifford Irving wrote the fake biography of Howard Hughes. I think it's as, as good a you know, film as Richard Gere has ever done. One of my favorite Lasse Hallstrom movies, and I've done three yep. movies. Yep. Um, and I thought it was great. It's a, it, if you get a chance, it's, it's a fun movie. Uh, it's uh, moving on. too long, but it's good. So here now we get into some, uh, maybe, some maybe we'll get some juicy stuff out of this yeah. one. Yeah. Bro Broken Arrow. I was fired off of that movie. I didn't know that. Um, yeah, but I did was. you get producer credit? Yes, I did. I was asked to leave uh, on the first day of, of production. They asked Why? me to leave the set. Well, um, I let's just say that I like to get very involved in my films. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I was working with a director. Who was a director? John Wu, incredibly oh, sure. talented guy. Yeah who subsequently I have become friendly with, and we were working on another picture together. Mm -hmm. It was one of these things where I had just made Speed. The, the, this came right after Speed. Uh, Graham Yost, who wrote Speed, also wrote this movie. He was also asked to leave too, by the way. We were, we were really? both asked to leave, yes. Um, and I, I, um, I think that a producer's job is to protect the movie, protect the director, uh, and not worry about who you're pissing off because if you worry about who you're pissing off, you might as well just be a studio executive. Well, you had told me the story about the, well, I don't know, it was a lunch or a dinner you had with John Travolta. Uh, well, I, had a, I did have a, a lunch with John Travolta where he, 
l- let's get back to that. For, okay. Just, okay. What I will say is that on the first day of, of production, um, I was fighting with the studio. They, they were doing things that I thought were disrespectful to me and to, um, and to the director, and I called them on it, and they didn't like it. Um, and they got mad, and they said, well, why are you? I said, because, because number one, I'm the producer. I developed the script. I hired the director. Oh, and by the way, not to be an asshole about it, but I also just produced a massive hit for you guys where you made a shitload of money. So maybe you could just give me a little respect and know that if I'm pushing back, it's not to be difficult. It's because this is how I I do my job and I believe in what I'm believing. And Gary, it's what you said. It's it's like you're not there to to suck up, although plenty of producers do, you're there to try and make the best movie. And, 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 and this is okay, as long as everybody's respectful of each other. But on the first day, I did three things that annoyed, evidently, an, according to the studio, annoyed the director. One thing happened was that the DP was setting up a shot, and I noticed that the fire, you know, when you're making a fire in a film, you don't use a real fire, you use gas and you, you know, you, 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 it's fake, but it looks real. And I looked at the fire and we were going to be shooting that in a couple of hours. And I said, I don't think it looks good. You know, I'm doing my advance work for the director. That's what I always do. And the DP said, well, why don't you look through the lens? So I looked through the lens. I said, yeah, I think you need to raise the flame or blah, blah, blah. But, you know, when, when, let's just get it as best we can. And when John gets here, the director, he'll decide. Well, somebody said, oh, what's he looking through the lens for? He's not the director. That's number one. Number two, there was a, an actor who, who was, was, again, it was the first day. So we were, once we set the look, we set the look of these characters. And I thought the guy looked really weird. So I pulled the director over and I said, uh, John, do you, do you like this actor's haircut? He goes, mm-hmm. his English was not great. I said, okay, John likes it, let's move on. What got back to the studio was that I was meddling in the director's business and they said, we want you to come home. I said, when? They said, now. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was basically thrown off the movie, which was very painful to me. Cool. Um, so tell, can you tell the John Travolta lunch story or no? We had lunch. And basically what he said was, listen, there are certain things that I, I, I would like, certain things that I expect, and if I don't get them, maybe I will be sick one day and won't come out of my trailer, or maybe, basically he was trying to let me know who was boss. Who was boss? And I basically said, yes, boss. <laughs> <laughs> but at the time, I was trying to get him to do mm. my movie. Um, All right, I, I, I want to keep moving here because I want to get to uh, well, by the By the way, he was fine. He was fine. All right. Paulie, do you want to talk about it? He did a parrot movie. I mean, does anybody really give a shit? No, nobody gives a shit. <laughs> Black Dog. So he went from... This was, this was Mark's animal uh, era. Yeah, this was like, like dog, Picasso's I mean, blue period. This right, this was his animal, animal, animal period. I have to be honest, I never saw Black Dog. Um, <laughs> okay. I we didn't the, either. We bought the movie in a package of films. We were financing it, and we weren't, we weren't the producers. So I got an executive producer. Credit, okay, the I, year is 1997. Yes. Richard Rodat. What Robert, comes, wrote Robert that. Uh, wrote that. Okay, yes. Robert wrote that. Uh, yes. Comes into your office, sends you a script. What happens? Uh, this is all the setup for Saving Private Ryan. Yeah. How's that for a cliffhanger? Well, in part two, we discuss the development and production of Saving Private Ryan and how that little movie didn't win an Oscar and how Mark feels about that. We discuss the Oscars, Independence Day, and whether your kids should spend 50 grand on film school every year or take that money and run. It's great stuff. You don't want to miss it. And please, 